expensive, much like doctors lose their license and attorneys. We need to make sure that law enforcement can be held accountable as well. And I think those two things will assist with policing better within the community and getting both sides to community and law enforcement to have a vested responsibility on improving uh, the relationship. Okay, is uh, Dr. Gillian back? Can y'all hear me? All right, let me make sure. Yeah. Can I hear me? Okay. Yeah. Gillian, you yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, just making sure. Okay, uh, I think we had a lot of great responses so far. Um, I think we've looked at a lot of the elements which cause this, and we've looked at some of the elements and ways that we can fix this. Now, when we're trying to find responsibility and we're trying to hold these police officers accountable and this system accountable, where should we look to? Who is actually responsible when holding these people accountable? How do we enact that change? Any volunteer? I'm going to give Chief Buckley a shot. <laughs> <laughs> and let him jump in here. Chief Buckley? Chief Buckley, are you still online? Uh, this is John Gilliland. From what I understand is that we're having some uh, internet outages in the area, and we've lost some, some of the members of our panel. Uh, and so I'm not sure how all of you are being affected. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I can hear you, Dr. G. And, and I didn't see uh, Chief Buck. I think we lost him as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk about, first of all, uh, when it comes to uh, practice and procedures and law enforcement, you have um, a, your standard operating procedure or, or what we would call our general orders. And uh, very little time is spent on general orders in law enforcement academy. Very little. I remember them giving me a thick manual and telling me, okay, keep this when you leave, turn it back in. And every now and then when they have some addendums, you assign for the addendum and they'll tell you to read it. Yeah, right. Okay. It doesn't become applicable until uh, I need to actually apply that and I want to research it. So our, uh, the, the, the onus is on the leadership. Okay. They, 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 in order for a department to change, that has to be a buy-in from the administrators at the top. Okay. On down. I've seen policies come out and officers on the lower end, they would say, hey, like for instance, wearing a hat, something as simple as wearing your hat. Yeah, we'll wear it for a couple of weeks and it'll go away. And, and so when you have all of this inconsistency in leadership, and these are things that I experienced. Now, when I say I, I'm talking about I was a military police, Jackson Police Department. I retired as an intelligence officer with the Gangman Commission and the highest kind of shared problem. So I've done this on every level. So I've seen this consistently, but I'll honestly say the most consistent one was military police. But until we get that uh, buy-in from administration to hold these supervisors, the lieutenants, uh, hold them accountable, then uh, that we won't have any long-lasting uh, uh, effective policies if we keep changing them uh, uh, just to suit whatever the current situation and you have to buy into that and when you and, and how when you have a new class you have to implement that into your new training academy instead of just recycling the old ideas over and over again uh there are no new administrative policies now, i can't speak for uh uh the uh dr Gill i'm uh, not dr gillen but the other uh gentleman who was at monroe i don't know how they do theirs but hey i'm just speaking from what i've seen through my years, 32 years of law enforcement. And I'll, I'll, I'll tag in on the end of, of that uh, for just a minute, because I know we're about to run out of time. And, uh, you know, absolutely, I support and endorse everything that the uh, um, lieutenant said as well, in terms of the accountability as it pertains to the policy and things of that nature. And, and that's something that I'm definitely firm in, and one thing I do know from being the chief here in Louisiana and meeting with chiefs across the country, particularly the South, is that uh, for the most part, none of us 
want misconduct by officers. Uh, so what I would add to what was said about how do we improve that, not only, only should it be improved from within and holding everybody accountable from top to bottom, I also think that we need to change the way, and this is through legislators, uh, community leading involvement and particularly getting laws changed, is the, the, the teeth to hold officers accountable. And I'll give you one example, and this is in the Police Bill of Rights, and I've always had, a, 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 uh, I guess, a disagreement with it from being a union representative at the police department to being a detective having to investigate, you know, uh, in some cases, police misconduct to being the chief. And this is just one example. And this is what we see across the country is that when an officer get involved in an event by law, he or she has 30 days to give a statement um, in what's called the police bill of rights. And the question that always comes up, and I think now is what we need to revisit when we talk about police reform, is should that be changed? And I'll end with this example. If an everyday citizen go out and completely you know, uh, violate the law and kill someone, they're the expectation for a statement then once they get apprehended or they get arrested. So we have a law enforcement that goes out and in this case violate policy, which is law enforcement law. You intentionally violate policy. And we're not talking about a questionable event. We're talking about one that's clear cut wrong. That officer still by law has rights to wait 30 or 40 days. And what that does is it gives a lot more time for people to get upset, to get frustrated, to start off with peaceful protests, to end up in violent protests, all those different things. So I think at the end, to start holding accountable more, we really need to look at the procedure of how employees are held accountable when it's out of the uh, the reach or uh, nothing that the leaders, uh, whether it's the chief, the sheriff, or maybe even some top management can do. And I think that's something really need to be revisited is looking at, like I said, just the procedures on how you hold officers accountable. Can uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. One of the questions that I, this is John Gillen. We we were all of us are having some internet problems here today. One of the questions that I have is that can police actually police themselves? That seems to be an issue, and especially when we consider the roles that unions play in policing. And it's almost to a point to where administrators, police administrators, hands are tied because of the police union and what was negotiated in those contracts. Could you guys speak to that? Well, let me let me say right quick, uh, something that I think needs to be implemented and it goes to what the chief was just saying. Uh, most people probably never heard of something known as procedural law, okay? Yes, yeah, substantive law and procedural law. Procedural law applies throughout the criminal justice system and it spells out. And I tell my students, uh, the laws are black and white. I'm not talking about people. It was written on that paper. If law enforcement agencies catch these young officers like Lee Vance did with myself and you focus on procedural law, it spells out what you can, what you can't not do. Uh, and it also will uh, say what punishments can be administered. So we have to go back and, and, and start focusing. But what happens uh, is happening a lot. You're getting guys who are in law enforcement three years and they're becoming FTO officers, training other officers. When I came on the police department, they called us a rookie for five years for a simple reason. They say, you don't know anything. And to that point, uh, uh, it causes a problem. But yes, uh, we can police ourselves. But you have to follow uh, and understand procedural, procedural uh, law and also the due process of law. And once you get that, and, and then you have to enforce it when that officer violates that, you have to act on that. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's my take on that. And, and I'm going to add to that, yeah, I'm going to add to that. I'm going to put just a different uh spend on even though i completely understand the perspective that was just mentioned when, when it asked can police police themselves 
Um, like I mentioned, my first comments, and Dr. G, I don't think that you heard it. I firmly believe and know from men and women that I work with and those that I met know that 90% of law enforcement do their job as they should. But if you're asking the open and honest question of me, can they police themselves? My response would be no. And at least not effective because that's what I believe is why we have the problem that we do have within the system because those 90% of the good officers that do what they want uh, should be doing. And this is just, can police hold each other accountable? And this is going from internal affairs investigation to report misconduct. Most of those 90% of officers may hear about a misconduct issue, may have witnessed a misconduct issue, but won't say anything about it unless they get specifically asked. And my concern as a as the profession goes is and that's why i mentioned at the beginning the shared responsibility just like we demand or expect as law enforcement the community to take an active role in improving the quality of life in their community by participating in the neighborhood watch and cooperating with the police what we don't do within the profession is do those same things effectively enough because i'm convinced that if we do that and if others in the profession know that if you, you know, going to violate policy, violate civil rights as it pertains to dealing with people, and in this case, specifically minorities, we will report you. We will write you up. We will support, you know, the administration termination of you. We're not going to defend you when you know you're going to do those things wrong. But what end up happening is what you mentioned, Dr. G, is that, you know, and, and I know I know there's a right for all this. So I'm not I'm all for due process. Right. But you end up with unions getting on board. You end up with attorneys finding a twist. You end up with uh, people getting their jobs back. And, and I just want to close real quickly with a actual case that you guys can look up and follow that I'm actually involved in. I fired a police officer just before I retired in 2017. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about it because it's public record, but I fired him in 2017 for testing positive for uh, marijuana. He appealed that termination to the civil service board, which consists of five people, policemen, firemen, and three civilians. One civilian happened to have lived next door to him and just refused to believe that he, uh, uh, he would smoke marijuana. So the board ended up giving this job back on a three to two vote. And that was down racial lines, by the way, just when we're dealing with the white officer. That was in 2017. The same officer just got arrested last month for excessive force that was caught on videotape and uh, for kicking a guy in the head, knocking his teeth out that now there's a civil suit and protest in Monroe. Uh, his name, if you want to look it up and follow it further, if you hadn't seen it, is Jared, J-R-E-D, Desideer. Well, it's one of those cases, Dr. G, that you that you uh, just mentioned, is that he was terminated. He had some other issues in his background that I can't mention that I'm aware of, but he was terminated by me. He was brought back to the job. Um, the district court later upheld my termination, but because the civil service board gave him his job back, he had the right to work until all his appeals remedy are exhausted. So the district court overturned the civil service board. The court of appeals in Louisiana supported the district court. And then this event happened before um, uh, it made it to the state Supreme Court. So that's kind of what you're talking about, Dr. G. And that's the challenge in terms of when you do try to get rid of a bad officer, they get their jobs back. Dr. Gillian, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, just making sure. I'd yeah. like to thank you all for uh, your comments and your insights. Um, I just have one last question as regards to uh, pol uh, policing and uh, black community. Do we still have anybody left over from education on this side? Besides me? <laughs> okay, that leaves two of us. Okay, let's stick with who we got. So. There have been certain issues with different communities, say like Jackson itself, predominantly black communities, urban communities, where we see the suburban areas surrounding those communities express com policing on those areas. 
You can look at places like Pearl, you can look at Madison, you can look at Ridgeland, and you see that most of their arrests or their stops, most of the revenue driven up from tickets and all the rest of that come from citizens of, Jack, uh, citizens of Jackson. You can look at a lot of urban areas and see the exact same thing, where large business districts are police and patrol at, with particularly target communities coming in and out. So how then do we deal with that? How can we help to break that system, which is basically setting up a police barrier amongst these communities, which are not their own? Well, one of the things that, uh, I don't want to keep talking, but I have a master's degree in criminology, and it makes me look at things more on the academic side than the theoretical side. And one of the big theoretical uh, perspectives I like to look at just what you're talking about is the concentric zone theory, okay, where uh, a man is in the inner city and then crime moves out, you have your zones of transition, and from uh, the degrade of the inner city, what moves out to these different zones, you have your malls, and then it gave birth to the suburbs. So I use this example. I was born on Dansby Street, down the street from Jackson State. Mm. My neighbor's not going to break into my house because he knows I don't have nothing. I just borrow sugar from him. So, man, <laughs> we, they will travel out to these zones, okay? And where are these zones? Pearl, Rankin County. So once they know this, the the the... the uh, certain sheriffs and certain chiefs like to play um, gatekeeper, oh, yeah. and, and they want to um, make sure they send a message back to uh, our inner concentric zone, the people in there, look, if you go out there, I'm going to do this, is this going to happen? So their loyalty is to preserving their, to protecting their citizens, but also putting a strong face on and showing those citizens that, look, we are working hard for you to keep you safe. And uh, so that's my ideology where this all comes from. Guys, let me let me interrupt. We have uh, only one member from the uh, other group uh, is still with us. And I think that's Dr. Ricardo Brown. And we are uh, more than halfway through the, 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 uh, the show here. And what I would like to do, in which all of the guests here uh, uh, would like for you to participate in, Let's have a discussion regarding COVID-19 and this, uh, the return to schools that's being mandated by gov- governors across the country and school boards across the country in opposition to some of the uh, state health officers. So, Dr. Brown, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you elaborate? The discussion that we had this morning, I would like for you to extend it, please. Okay, so before, you know, I talk about that, I I would just, you know, reiterate that COVID-19 is an infectious disease, and it's an airborne infectious disease, as you all know. And so the way that it's transmitted from person to person is through, it's an airborne transmission. The airborne transmission can occur in one or two ways. Large droplets, which they call uh, uh, droplets, and then smaller droplets, which are aerosol aerosolized. So it's almost like an aerosol that is much smaller and travels much further distance. Um, with regards to schools opening, I want to say that the CDC has guidelines on opening schools. Um, at present, the CDC's uh, reputation is taking a hit because of so many changes in the approach and the policy that they've uh, taken on. So the risks are stratified. So from low risk to high risk or higher risk, the low risk involves uh, teaching virtually only. So kids are not coming to school, teachers are not interacting with students. So that's the lowest risk. And then obviously the highest risk is when schools are trying to uh, have face-to-face classes as normal in which the students and the faculty or the, the teachers are interacting in close proximity. So, so those are, uh, a li- that's a little bit about the background of the virus. Um, next, I want to just say and talk about, well, if you did open, so let's say you're in a higher risk, what sort of things would you do in order to mitigate the risk 
uh, and the transmission of virus from one person to the to another. Well, first you would have to wear masks, as uh, most of you are probably doing, uh, or or it's called face coverings. Uh, some institutions uh, monitor your temperature when you come in the door, but that does not mitigate against people who may have the virus and have no symptoms. Uh, other uh, procedures are deep cleaning facilities regularly, cleaning surfaces, washing your hands properly, hand sanitizing. And then when you cough and sneeze, you don't want to do it in the air. So it's probably preferable to just use your elbow and sneeze or cough in your elbow. Um, some people advocate for sneezing in the tissue, but if you sneeze in the tissue and you put it in the garbage can and the cleaning person interacts with it, then that could be a route of transmission. And finally, if you're sick, you should stay home. Now, to, to answer your other question about uh, schools opening in some states and schools not opening in other states, it, it, it happens, as you all know, to be uh, at the whim of the governor. So it all depends on who your governor is as to what the position of the state is in terms of opening schools. Uh, Even though the data is staring you right in the face, um, it seems to me that the governor has the say in, in what approach school systems take to opening, even though the data may speak against it. So you would be fortunate if you lived in a state that looked at the data and said that we are not going to open schools because the data is saying, or data science, is saying that the risk is higher in our state because of the number of cases, as the number as well as the number of deaths, as well as the number of hospitalizations. Whereas if you lived in a state that you had no control of that decision making and they um, in the face of the evidence that they were going to open, then parents are left with a difficult choice. So it's what I call the politici- politicization of public health. And now we're left to make our own decisions uh, uh, as to whether or not we send our kids to school, as to whether or not we teach uh, face-to-face, you know, or whether or not we uh, are teaching virtually. But one of the one of the questions one, one of the questions is are we at a point to where we have completely lost faith in our institutions such as the CDC and the FDA? If there was a virus, would we trust it to use it? Are you sorry? Do you mean if there were a vaccine, would you trust the vaccine? No. There was a vaccine. Would we trust? Hello. Yes. So, so that goes back in our. It d- depends on the community. So you're familiar with the Tuskegee experiment, where they experimented on African Americans and never gave them the treatment that they knew would cure the disease. What they were doing was trying to understand the natural history of, of the disease. What would happen if you left that disease untreated? So there's a lot that you can learn, but it's unethical. Um, so, so there are different communities that still have fears about participating in trials, uh, clinical trials, or even taking the vaccine in the fear that um, the vaccine might harm them. Whereas other communities don't hold that same fear. So it it depends on the community. Getting back to your other question about the trust in our institutions, um, I would say, again, I I tried to be as political as possible, but when you put politics and public health together, depending on the politics, that may not be a good mix. So I would say that common sense probably would be the best remedy. Uh, The first case of coronavirus in the United States was on January 22nd. And I happened to uh, be a professor of infectious uh, epidemiology and teach infectious diseases. And I had to make a trip two days later. And I took a picture of myself on the plane with a mask. Well, at that time, CDC and the WHO were saying you don't have to wear a mask. 
So when the institutions go back and forth with recommendations, you as an individual have to take all that information in, integrate it, and try to make the best decisions that you can for yourself. The latest, Dr. Gilliland, it, that, that came out yesterday is that, that CDC is saying that if you are exposed to someone who had COVID-19, you don't necessarily need to be tested. Well, there's another uh, body of evidence that suggests that that's how you can control the virus, by testing. So where did the political pressure come from to uh, pressure CDC to change their own guidelines? And uh, I think you are all aware of, of pretty much what, what pressures that might be uh, without me directly telling you where it's coming from. <laughs> And Dr. Brown, yes. uh, this is Marin O'Payton. I was able to get on the conference call line. Okay. You know, I concur with everything that you're saying. I would just want to add one thing in reference to, reference to Dr. Gillian's question, would you take the vaccine? I think that the vaccine needs to be tested and proven, whether or not it's safe or not. I think that's one of the things that is going to let the public let us know that, okay, this is an okay vaccine. Okay, no one wants to take a vaccine if we don't know that it has been proven safe. And then in reference to returning to school, I'm going to use the old common sense approach. Okay, we know about the science. All right, but what we have to consider are the risk versus the benefits. Okay. If we know the virus is deadly and we know that it can infect persons, we know that some people are going to get sick. Is that something that we want to do? So really what we're doing, or I should ask the question, are we putting the economy before health? I'm just posing a question. What's more important? So hopefully in the days to come, a couple of semesters, after we found better treatment or some treatment, and there is a vaccine, um, and we can somehow begin to mitigate uh, this virus, this invisible killer, you know, is it worth sacrificing a couple of semesters or a semester? Or do we want to send people back? We've got thousands of people in quarantine across the country from opening schools, okay? And we know that most of these are children, but yet and still, the children don't live alone. They've got parents at home, grandparents, people that they come in contact with. So we are risking exposing a majority of persons in the community for the sake of economy. So that's why I asked that question. Let me respond to that, Dr. Payton, and say that, as you all know, that when a vaccine is comes on the market, it has to go through all five phases of the clinical trial. And exactly. so, so, you know, most likely, if there is a vaccine available, and it's been tested from beginning phase one with animal studies, all the way to large populations of individuals. And I believe that we're currently in phase three going to phase four. So uh, let me say that for in all likelihood, you know, for myself, if a vaccine came available, I'm going to take it, okay? Because I understand the science uh, behind vaccine development. What I was saying earlier, though, is that some of the studies in the federal government, and you know the Tuskegee experiment has generated fear in different communities because it was unethical. The studies were, that were done on black men, uh, it was deemed to be unethical as you well know. Let me just touch on the last part that, that we were discussing, and, and, it, and I called it the politicization. Well, apparently in the state of Mississippi, it's been determined that they are, they, this state wants to open uh, despite the science. Okay. Yeah. And they yeah. want to sort of not make the hard choices uh, because of politics. Now, exactly. for a state institution, 
And they're saying that you have to go in there and teach face to face. And I know that I'm in a high risk uh, category being African American male uh, and, and maybe uh, some family history pre 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 existing conditions. Then I face the possibility of losing my job because I will refuse to risk my life. And I think that's uh, a, a fairly sad. Can I say one thing about vaccines? Uh, and trust me, as a member of uh, uh, military police, we deployed for Desert Storm. They came up with this vaccine that they wanted to give all of the troops on mm-hmm. the Desert Storm uh, for anthrax and whatever. And you know, we could never get a clear question on mm-hmm. what the what the effects, a long term effect of the vaccines were. Well, let me bring it fast forward. And if you may remember, there was a major who was a medical doctor stationed at Keesler Air Force Base. Air Force Base. When it was his time to deploy, he refused to take the vaccine. And, mm-hmm. and he was court-martialed. And there was also a colonel who was stationed in, uh, I think, Kentucky or somewhere. He was a physician. He, too, refused to take the vaccine. And he was court-martialed. Now we're starting to see the long-term effects. There are members that were in my unit that have who have never had asthma, have asthma, that keep mm-hmm. the board with asthma, they uh, they have uh, 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 psychological issues. So when you talk, I, I, I talk about the vaccines, I, I, and I'm gonna be honest, I stole my shot records for that very reason. Because in case down the line something happened to me, I have my own official military shot records, and they call it the Desert Storm illness. But it's going to be treated the same way Agent Orange was treated during uh-huh. Vietnam. Once a lot of us die off, then they're going to come back and admit, hey, it was the vaccine. So I have my own take on that. You I, I would like to say I do, too. And I do understand cl- clinical trials. I, I have studied the history of what the United States has done with uh, experimenting with people of color and 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 using uh, uh, using us as guinea pigs for certain kinds of birth control pills and a whole whole bunch of things. Even if they tell us that it's been through clinical trials, we I don't think that that the mass of people, uh, first of all, maybe they don't even understand the whole idea of clinical trials and the different phases and all that. But I would think that um, many of them would not be uh, being paranoid, although, you know, you can still be persecuted even if you're paranoid. But um, I don't think they would be being paranoid if they questioned what our government said about uh, the efficacy and 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 and. Uh, of these vaccines, even if they've been through all the stages of, of trials and a judge safe, because you, you have to ju- uh, trust FDA, you have to trust uh, CDC, two agencies that clearly have been extremely politicized. And if they had a vaccine tomorrow, and they told me it had had all, and I've had COVID, by the way. And they told me that it had been through uh, every stage and all those kinds of things. I don't know that I would trust them. I think I'd be quite, quite um, using a lot of common sense not to trust it. And so, even though it may be widely available, I think many people are going to wait and and look for impacts and it didn't have to be that way because i'm a child of the era of polio shots of course we were much more trusting then but but they didn't politicize it the way that we see them doing now and of course we weren't aware of all the times that the u.s had used people of color uh, as guinea pigs either so you know i think armed with that knowledge um, many people will will question whether they ought to get a vaccine. Let me let me uh, 
we're getting close to our time and there's one question sort of a brief response if is that do you think that the way that we're handling the virus now nationally and, and at the state level will be different after november elections if biden wins <laughs> <laughs> if Trump wins, we all ought to have be looking for another place to go, although most places won't let us in because we live in the United States. Okay, so my response to that is, again, you have to use common sense. And the best way to, I think, uh, inform yourself is to read and, and study and, 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 and be informed. Uh, there are different groups of people that won't take vaccines or they won't take anything uh, because of their fear. And then, that, and then there are other groups that will take it, it depending on their experience. I will say that, that vaccinations uh, have been successful as an epidemiologist. Okay. Uh, it has eradicated smallpox, polio. Okay. So, so again, it, 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 I understand the fear and I understand the concerns and I understand the politicization of, of uh, public health. And I think it's a very dangerous territory that we entered into. And because of the approach of the, of the, of the government, people are going to be more confused than they need to be. I, I just don't think it's irrational for an intelligent person who reads, listens to the news and everything else to have some questions about this vaccine, especially since it's been hurried. So, and given the climate that we live in, I'm not saying that people shouldn't take vaccinations and I'm not an anti-vaccination person. I just don't think it's irrational to question whether one should just accept what this government says is a viable vaccine. Yeah, Dr. Marlon Young, I wouldn't be in a position at an individual level to talk about what <laughs> a fear of an individual. As an epidemiologist, I'm talking about population. Uh, oh, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you think about vaccines, and I, I would just challenge you once, once more, is that that some vaccines are mandatory. So, from the time that your child is born. Uh, if he or she are, are, is not vaccinated, then they make the, the population vulnerable. Sure, but even those hey, are mandatory, as you know, because you can get dispensations or have been able until this breakout of, of measles to get dispensations for religious and medical reasons. You Absolutely. still can get them for medical hey, reasons. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. this, has been, this has been a wonderful discussion. And this has been such an esteemed panel, panels and panelists. We're going to have to have to do this again. And and the next time we do this, maybe we won't have all the problems uh, of the Internet. And uh, my co-host, uh, Dr. Cotton, um, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. And we're looking forward to more up more opportunities to get to uh to get to uh get to know you oh, and so i want to join me all right. Right. oh and so doc. i oh, yes go ahead doc <laughs> i missed something i didn't hear that i didn't either <laughs> I think that's a background discussion. Okay. Well, I think our time is up. And I would like to thank you guys so much for being here with us tonight, especially on such a short notice. Uh, you guys yeah. responded well, and the conversation was everything that we thought it would be. So what we wanted to do is um, give you the opportunity to come back and further this discussion. So on behalf of my co-hosts um, and the Women for Progress, we'd like to thank you, and we would like for you to tune in next month for the um, September edition of Man Cave. So thank you guys, and good night.
Good night. Good night. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye. 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 I have more to say next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.